Okay. So let's uh, continue on where we left off last time. So if you remember, we were talking about network protocols, uh, and there's at least three kind of different layers of the network that uh, we were talking about, actually four here. One is kind of the actual physical link layer where we have differences between Ethernet and ATM and Wi-Fi and so on. The network layer is really the key, which is IP. So the idea is that everything underneath implements IP with routing, and then you have the network layer. And then above that, you get interesting transport things like UDP and TCP. We're going to talk about that uh, some more today. And then on top of that, you build actual applications. Okay, and. Uh, this particular layering has been extremely successful because it's allowed a wide variety of interesting uh, physical transmission media to tie into one global internet. And so that's uh, kind of one of the key things about the success of the internet. And by the way, you can kind of see here, this is what's often called the narrow waste is IP uh, right here. Uh, it's the common protocol that everything forms. All right, were there any questions about this at all? Now, on our uh, extra class uh, on the first uh, Monday of uh, RRR week, one of the things I'll be asking you next week is if there are any topics that people want to talk about. But one of the topics I may spend a little time on is a discussion of whether IP is still the right narrow waste for the Internet of Things. So that may be one of our topics. But Okay. So the other thing we were just kind of in the middle of before we ran out of time was this idea of handling both reliability and packet ordering in the same kind of global idea, which is, with the same global mechanism, I mean, which is a windowing protocol, where there's some number of outstanding packets. Here I've got n equal 5. And uh, you let them be transmitted, and each one has a different sequence number. And uh, at the remote side, you have to make sure you have a queue that's big enough to hold all the packets in flight. And the acknowledgments that come back kind of tell you, did they make it or not? And if they didn't make it via a timeout, then you retransmit. And if they did make it because you saw the act, then you kind of continue on with your transmission. And um, I guess the question I would ask were, were there any questions on this basic idea of a windowing protocol? So you can see that by uh, having separate sequence numbers here, we can have many packets in flight, and they can become reordered in the network, and we can still order them at the destination, which is the key. Can anybody give me a good reason to have more than one packet in flight at a time? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. It's a form of pipelining. Uh, without that, you could end up with you know, I don't know, a 10 gigabit link and you're only getting a few kilobytes uh, uh, per second out of it because you have to transmit something all the way, wait for the act, transmit the next one, and so on. And so by pipelining, we get much better use of the bandwidth. So what I'd like to do is introduce TCP for those of you that haven't seen it before. And I saw about half of the class had not taken uh, 160 or one, uh, 122 or an, another network equivalent. And so, um, Basically, the idea is TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol. It's implemented on top of IP. So if you remember, uh, the IP packet header had a two, uh, a, an 8-bit protocol number, and TCP is one of them. Oops. And the basic idea is very simple. It's a stream uh, protocol. You put a stream of bytes in. The same stream of bytes comes out the other side, slightly delayed for time, of course, and they are in the exact same order that you put them in. That's the uh, essential API here. Now, there's things like how do you connect, uh, how do you deal with a failure, all that stuff. But the user is hidden. Uh, to some extent, the user doesn't have to actually worry about that once a TCP channel has been established. OK? And uh, this is IP protocol 6. So if you were to take a look in the IP header, you'd see that there's a 6 in that 8-bit field. It's a reliable byte stream between two processes on different machines over the internet. So because we're going from process to process rather than from machine to machine, what do we know about either side of that connection? There's not just an IP address on either side. What else is there? Say again? 
Right, there's an application. How do we identify that application on either side? By port, yes. Okay, good. And um, details here are uh, basically, it doesn't matter what you put in. It gets fragmented into reasonable chunks, which are the MTU size, the minimum transfer unit, maximum transfer unit, excuse me. And uh, notice that each one of these links can have a different MTU. And as a result, if uh, you have a big MTU locally here and smaller ones in the middle, um, then ultimately the packets get fragmented as the, the uh, sort of, you know, the smallest unit here. Okay. Um, it uses a window-based acknowledgement protocol, kind of like what we just showed you, but different. In fact, I'm going to show you how it's different. It's a little better. Um, and the window of how many outstanding things reflects a couple of things. It certainly reflects the storage at the receiver. You never want to have more packets in the network than can be stored at the receiver. But the window also needs to reflect something about the total pipe between point A and point B. So what we want to do is we want to adjust the number of packets automatically to just fill up the pipe from source to destination and no more. If we put too many packets down there, we're going to end up causing extra congestion, uh, and that's never good. Or if we put not enough packets down there, we don't get the full bandwidth. And so our automatic protocol needs to adapt and figure out what the right window size is. Um, other detail, uh, which part of this is an automatic retransmission of lost packets. and. Uh, and also automatic reordering. So basically, we have to do whatever is required under the covers so that the user of the TCP stream doesn't have to know anything other than you put bytes in and you get bytes out in the same order. All right, any questions on the overall API? Everybody with me? Okay, you use TCP every day. Okay, it's uh, one of the most successful protocols on the planet. Um, so let's look a little bit about how this works. So at the uh, sender side, there's a sender window. Uh, and the sender window has kind of three regions. So imagine that every packet, uh, actually every byte in some sense that goes out, has a unique sequence number that's uh, monotonically increasing. And so we can divide the stream of bytes that have, uh, in this way. So there's the ones that have been sent and act at the destination already. There's ones that have been sent but not act yet, and then ones that are not yet sent. Okay, And what I just said there, and I'm going to say it again, is in TCP, the uh, sequence numbers are not per packet. They're really about bytes. Okay, So a sequence number uh, is a number that keeps increasing as you send bytes through. And so we can look at the set of possible sequence numbers is really representing the set of bytes that went in and came out. Those, of course, we divide things into packets, and it's packets that get sent, but it's the, uh, the bytes that are acknowledged. And I'll show you how that works in a second. At the receiver side, we have a similar sort of scenario here, which are we have parts of the sequence range which have been received and already given to the application. We have parts of the range that have been received and not yet given to the application, so they're only buffered. And then, of course, there's parts that aren't received yet. All right. So this part of the space, uh, you know, who knows? You may never actually receive them. Okay. Are there any questions on this? Everybody with me on the basic idea? So now, let's take a look at how this works. So let's assume that we have done some negotiation to figure out what sequence number we're dealing with. And by the way, TCP is a bidirectional connection. So when you set up a connection, you're setting up uh, a stream in both directions. We're only going to look at one for a moment here. And what's going to assume for a moment we're starting at sequence number 100, and there are going to be 300 bytes available in the, uh, the receiver's window. Okay, And so at some point in this scheme, we're going to get an acknowledgment back either it's as part of the setup or uh, some historical transmissions we haven't looked at yet, that say here as follows, acknowledgement says we're on sequence number 100, and by the way, there are 300 bytes available. Okay, And of course, this is going to change. So the first thing we might send is we get a bunch of bytes from the, uh, at the sender side, and let's suppose we get 40 bytes. And so what we're going to do is we're going to send a packet that has uh, 40 bytes in it, sequence number 100. 
So that means that this is really representing bytes 100 up through 139. We're going to send that out, and assuming it makes it to the receiver properly, the acknowledgment we get back is, oh, we're acknowledging up to sequence number 140, which is a byte we haven't received yet. Okay, And by the way, um, there's only 260 bytes left in the, in the receiver window. Okay. And now here's the next one. Oh, we're starting sequence number 140. We've got 50 bytes in it. The acknowledgment we get back is an acknowledgment for 190. And by the way, there's only 210 back. All right, you guys get the picture. This is an interesting scenario here. Here, we're sending out a sequence number uh, with 230 on it. And what's happened along the way is somehow bytes 190 to 230 have been lost, or 190 to 229. And so, when we send this packet out, the acknowledgment we get back is not quite what you'd expect. So even though we sent a packet with sequence number 230 in size 30, notice that the, the uh, acknowledgment that came back is only uh, acknowledging 190 and 210 left. Can anybody explain what that means? Yeah. Yes. So all this is saying right now is, uh, gee, I've only gotten up to byte 190. Gee, I've only gotten up to byte 190. Okay? Gee, you got the point, right? So the idea here is that yes, we're sending, and yes, that 230 may have been received. In fact, it's probably, we could, we could say that this, uh, what we're seeing here is actually the receiver's buffer. We could actually have received it and put it in our buffer, but we're not going to acknowledge it yet because we're only acknowledging that we've gotten up to byte 190. So this means that the sender starts figuring out that something might actually be wrong. Okay, so now it's, the sender has been pipelining. It's continuing to send, and notice how we're still saying we're only up to 190 and so on. Okay, At some point, we get a timeout, and we realize, well, gee, we've been acknowledged up to 190. We better transmit that packet that was missing from 190 we send that out, and look what happened. The acknowledgment that come back says, oh, gee, I've got up to 340. Okay, And the reason for that is the receiver has been buffering as we go, and that one little packet filled in the missing piece. Okay, And then da -da -dum, you know, we're good to go for the next one and the next one. Question, yeah. Uh, you can buffer a lot. You can, you can have. Uh, you can have kilobytes, you can have megabytes. Now, normally you don't have megabytes in transit, so more in the kilobytes range, tens of kilobytes. Depends a lot on what the, the distance is. So if you actually have a satellite link, satellite links are high bandwidth but extra extraordinarily long latency, and there you can have hundreds of kilobytes in flight or more easily. Okay, so... and. It, it needs to adapt. Remember what I said before, that window on the receiver, uh, I mean the sender needs to adapt the window based on the latency to try to just fill the pipe up, but also moderated by the, the uh, window size at the receiver. So if the person that's configured the receiver hasn't told it about having enough, um, hasn't given it enough actual uh, storage, then you may end up not filling the pipe up because the sender is going to be limited by what can the receiver can receive. Okay, good. And notice, by the way, that as this is filling up, the, uh, the window size at the receiver is going down here. So that tells us at that point that the sender's got to stop because uh, even though all the data it send has been uh, acknowledged, the... Um, Destination hasn't, you know, destination application hasn't emptied this buffer yet, so there's there's basically no space at the receiver to accept anymore. Okay, and so this is, by the way, this is how TCP, one of the mechanisms that TCP uses to stop the sender when the receiver is full. Okay, questions? Good. Pretty simple. Now again. Notice that I could have partitioned this byte stream any way I wanted. I could have smaller packets, bigger packets, and the sequence numbers are on the bytes themselves, and so we'd have packets with different sequence numbers, but that's okay because I'm acknowledging the set of bytes that come up, okay? Not, not the packets themselves. Question, yeah.
Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, the question is basically when the sender sent 190, should it wait for the act before it sends any more? You know, six and a half of one half a baker's dozen of the other. I mean, you, you don't want to send too much extra into the network. And I'll say a little bit more about selective acts in a moment, but um, in this basic scheme here, it could go under the assumption that only one packet is lost. And, and it, so it would make no sense for it to send too much more before it saw the act. But as you could imagine, if you have a highly lossy um, transmission media, that might not be the best thing to do because you've got a bunch of things missing. Uh, and so there is, a, there is a, a more precise sort of protocol you can negotiate that lets you sort of know exactly what's missing. Yeah. Ah, good question. So the buffer gets emptied out. How does the uh, receiver signal the sender? Well, um, I can send an ACK for 400 with more storage in it. So that, so uh, I, I mentioned that TCP channels are bidirectional. They're actually continuously sending ACKs to each other. Uh, and so there's really no reason, you know, as things are opening up, your ACKs are reflecting more uh, space. and What's even better than that, it's not like they're sending acts as whole packets. In fact, part of sending data from one direction is carrying the acts from the other direction, and so it's pretty efficient. Good. Okay. So there is something called selective uh, acknowledgement where you can negotiate this at the beginning, and uh, the vanilla TCP acknowledgement scheme I just showed you basically uh, pretty much doesn't have a way to tell you what holes are in the receive, and you have to sort of assume there's just a single hole and find out later. Selective acknowledgement uh, actually has a way to put um, additional acknowledgement bytes in the, uh, in the header that sort of says more about what's uh, missing. And I'm not going to say any more about that. You can look it up. But this is a protocol that uh, sort of an enhancement to TCP that's been around for a while now decade maybe or so, and so it uh, depends on whether the source and destination both support it or not. Okay. So let's say a little bit about congestion. So how long should the, the timeout be for resending messages? I mean, you know, if it's too long, you basically waste time if the message is lost. If it's too short, you end up retransmitting even though, yeah, there's an act coming, there's just a delay. So. One of the things clearly is that not only do I have to adjust my window size, I need to adjust my timeout dynamically based on conditions. And there is a clear stability problem here, which is more congestion causes acts to be delayed, which causes unnecessary timeouts, which shoves more packets into the uh, network, which slows things down even more, and you get this positive feedback loop. Uh, which is pretty bad, okay? And so you got to be very careful not to transmit when you don't have to. And so how do you choose the sender's window size? And that's kind of part of the, the power of TCP. Uh, clearly, it's got to be less than the receiver's advertised buffer size. You want to match the rate of sending packets with the rate of the slowest link in the middle. So basically, I want to be able to send, 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 and just when I've sent my full window, I start getting acts back. I want to see that pipelining, okay? Um, and so uh, the sender basically uses an adaptive algorithm to decide the size of n. And the goal here is to fill the network between the sender and the receiver. And uh, basic technique is I'm going to experiment. I'm going to start small, and I'm going to slowly increase until I start dropping packets because there's too much congestion, and then I'm going to back off. That's exactly what TCP does. And has anybody ever seen, uh, probably not unless you've taken a network class, they show you the transmission rate from TCP and it's a sawtooth like this. Anybody ever seen that diagram before? Okay, why is that? Yeah, that's part of its attempt to figure things out. Okay, and it, it's, a, it's amazingly useful. It's called slow start. And basically, the idea is you start sending slowly, and as long as you don't have a timeout, you slowly increase the window size by one for each ACK. And so that window slice is slowly getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And as soon as you notice drop packets, 
then um, you get a timeout, then you basically cut back. Uh, and typically, you cut back by half. So you increase slowly, and then you cut back by half. And that's where this sawtooth comes from. And this is quite successful at finding, um, finding a good neighborly rate. And what do I mean by that? You want to make sure that you're not overwhelming the network. If multiple people come through a given channel, you want to find a rate that sort of gives your bandwidth evenly to the people coming through. Um, what it's not particularly good at is if you want to find a good rate and just get really high throughput at that rate, you know, get, get good throughput at that rate, it's constantly changing the rate. Okay? And so there's uh, companies that have uh, spent a lot of time and algorithms on how to optimize scenarios from uh, a remote office and a main office where there's lots of TCP channels. What they often do is you can open a single big TCP channel and optimize its window size and have a bunch of little ones going through. And there's all sorts of kind of cool tunneling sort of things they do for those optimi optimizing scenarios. All right. Now, what I did want to also point out here is this is uh, essentially the good neighbor aspect of TCP, which says if suddenly a new stream comes into play, people will back off so that you know people get share fair share of the center of the network. It's why use of UDP is sometimes considered not being good, a good neighbor because you can send UDP as fast as you want and there's no back off mechanism. Okay, that's point A. And point B, there have been some infamous bugs in TCP. TCP will only behave this way if TCP behaves this way. <laughs> so you can install your own version of a TCP driver, uh, TCP stack into your kernel, and people have done this in a way that violates this and just keeps sending packets regardless of what's going on, and you can get more than your fair share. And uh, there have been lots of ways of trying to recognize this. And now the core of the network will pretty much bounce you, I think, if they notice that you're not being a good neighbor. But uh, there, was, there were a lot of people that had hacked kernels to try to take advantage of this. All right. Questions? So uh, the last thing I wanted to say about this is, OK, that's great for what's going on when the connection's open. But how do you actually open it? It's a three-way handshaking. So the goal here is basically to agree on a set of parameters like start sequence number for each side, and so on. Um, and uh, basically, there's some randomness in that choice in order to avoid man-in-the-middle attacks. But uh, the idea here is the server kind of makes a listen call. I'll remind you of this in a second. The uh, client makes a connect call. And what that connect call does is it actually sends a SYN packet with a randomly chosen sequence number to uh, the server. The server that's listening decides to accept the connection at which point sends back a, uh, a SYN and ACK packet. So that's basically a packet with both the SYN bit and the ACK bit set. And that's with the new sequence number from this side. And then finally, you get uh, an ACK back. And that last ACK really kind of sets up the final connection and uh, is really acknowledging the, uh, the connection from server to client. And so this three-way handshaking is the fundamental piece that sets up a TCP connection. And it's how the uh, sequence numbers are exchanged in both directions. OK? Um, and SYN and ACK are uh, significantly um, uh, sufficiently unique that uh, they're often used to basically recognize that a connection is being opened. And you can put optimizer, network optimizer boxes kind of in the network between the client and the server. And those optimizer box, uh, boxes that are watching the packets go through can say, oh, there is a connection setting up going on here. And I can optimize that connection any way I want. Okay? And so they're actually, they'll transparently recognize SINs and ACKs and allow you to have uh, you know, transparent compression going on or any number of things between those two boxes. OK. Um, so. Three-way handshake adds a round-trip delay. Why do it? Uh, because the SYN basically acts as a cheap probe as well. Um, it's also a way to uh, protect against delayed packets from other connections and so on. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about how CLOSE works, which is a four-way connection uh, teardown. You get a FIN, 
uh, and a fin ax, so that basically closes the connection going from host one to host two. Um, host two may still be sending data. At some point, it sends a fin because it's done, you get an acknowledge back, and now you're done. Okay? So even when, say, host one has chosen to shut things down, it may continue to receive data from host two until the fin act sequence has gone through. Okay? And there are ways of doing this uh, retransmission so that you can deal with lost acts and so on. Questions? If the connection ends up half open, um, usually there's a timeout that ends up tearing it down. Yeah, that's a good question though. Yeah, question. No, the fin here is from host one to host two saying, I'm done. Host two says, okay, I acknowledge you're done. And then the other, and by the way, this, well, the way this really looks is there's a flag field in the header and there's some bits. And so a fin packet is one with the fin bit set going in that direction. So, or, and then there's an ax bit as well. Good. Yeah, question? Yep. Each side is both a sender and a receiver, correct. No such thing as a one-way TCP connection. Okay. So um, how do you choose the sequence number? And uh, I won't go through this in detail, but you can see that if everybody starts with sequence number zero, you can get a man in the middle that starts pretending to be the, uh, the other side, and you can do all sorts of things. And there were some interesting hijacks that happened uh, in the early days, back when people thought the Internet was a friendly place, uh, where people could actually, you know, after you've, uh, connected and typed your password and so on, then they would hijack your connection and, and start typing commands as if they were you by figuring out what your sequence numbers were. Of course, uh, that's why I, uh, you know, nobody should ever use un, uh, you know, unencrypted connections anymore. Um, so some ways of choosing uh, initial sequence numbers, there's lots of them, but the bottom line is you need to make sure that nobody can guess and you also need to make sure that um, you're not likely to have the same overlapping range as the previous connection because otherwise you can get con some confusion with retransmitting packets. And so there are some various ways that people go about that. Okay. All right. Good. So some administrivia. Okay. The uh, test is Wednesday. Um, it's going to be in Dwinell, 145, 155. Uh, if you've already seen on Piazza, there's uh, a, the nice thing about this exam is we're actually just down the hall from each other, so that's good. But um, AA through EE should be in 145, and EF through NK should be in 155. And uh, if your login is above NK, you don't exist. I hope you uh, don't exist. All topics, uh, including things up uh, that we get through today, are potentially fair game. Um, I know there's a little discussion on that. Uh, closed book, one page of notes, both sides. And the one thing that's very important is bring a calculator. Okay, you will do a calculation that, you know, you may do calculations that require a square root or a one over some number. You do not want to be doing long division Actually, I used to be able to know how to do square roots by hand. You do not want to do that either. So bring a calculator. Okay, I would bring a simple scientific calculator. It can't be a cell phone for obvious reasons. Um, okay, can't be network connected. Yeah, go ahead. Problem with graph, uh, what kind of a graphing calculator? Uh, you'll have to show it to your TA and see if they approve. It's probably okay. But dumber is better. Okay, not for you guys, for the calculator. All right, you guys want to be not, uh, want to uh, amp it up uh, for the term. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, we might not actually go over key value store today, so that would be, take it off of the list of possibilities. 
Yes. Well, I guess one of the ones, I mean, it, there's a caching element kind of to the notions up here. So you might want to look at caching too. We mostly talked about caching kind of right around midterm one. So, okay. And anything we don't test you on this time or on midterm one, we'll definitely test you on the final. Who knows? All right. Good. So uh, we, uh, if you remember, at the very beginning of the class, we kind of talked you through how to use TCP through sockets. How many people liked the first couple of lectures that uh, took you through a very quick use of the API of everything? How many people thought it was just either extraneous or confusing? How many people thought extraneous? Maybe I'll divide you guys up. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna have to have to decide whether we do that again next term or not. But anyway, so the socket is this key abstraction, which is a of an abstraction of a network IOQ. It's a, a Berkeley invention. Came out originally in uh, BSD Berkeley, from Berkeley. Um, it embodies one side of a communication channel, and you have the same interface regardless of where the other end is. So the other end of a socket could be on the local machine, it could be in Beijing, it could be on the moon. Okay, that's less likely. But the interface is the same, okay? And that's kind of what's cool about sockets. Uh, first introduced in 4.2 BSD. So this was a big release, by the way. 4.2 BSD had the fast file system, it had the sockets interface. Um, and uh, so that was, uh, that was a pretty amazing release of Unix. Um, it's, uh, so using sockets for the client-server interface, you guys have seen this multiple times now, but uh, basically on the server side, you create a socket, you bind to the particular protocol like TCP, and I'll point that out to you uh, explicitly in the moment, what the address is and the port is locally, and you call listen. And that basically is you advertising uh, to the world by binding to a port saying, I will accept connections Namely, remember the three three-way sin sin uh, sin act uh, scenario I showed you earlier, um, and you can perform a bunch of accepts, each one of which has a three-way handshake involved. And um, every one you're done with, you get a new socket. Yeah. That's right. Sockets give you a file descriptor. Correct. No. Okay, so, so a file descriptor and the file system are not the same thing. So this is, this is a good question. So keep in mind that everything in Unix appears like a file for, at a certain level, but it's not necessarily. We kind of talked about this earlier. This is a good, bring, good place to bring it up again. What it means is a file descriptor, you can do things like read, write, close, whatever. Does not mean there's a file underneath. That's an important thing to keep in mind, okay? Use of, the, the return of a file descriptor is really a handle to an internal management infrastructure that may or may not be connected to a file in the file system. Good question. Okay, everybody with me on that? So um, the other side, by the way, in the client, you also create a socket. So notice, by the way, the server creates a listen socket and then it gets a bunch of sockets, one per connection. On the client side, uh, you create a socket each time you want to make a connection, and then you perform a connect to do it. Both of these talk about binding to the protocol. So it's at the socket connection time that you make a decision whether you want to be a uh, TCP connection or a UDP connection. Okay, question, yes. So when you do a write system call on a socket, you're asking, magic. You do a write system call on a file descriptor that happens to be a socket. What it's gonna do is it's gonna put it in a, uh, a buffer in memory, probably. All right, and I'll show you, in fact, I'll show you in a moment exactly what the format of those buffers are in memory. Uh, and then it will get transmitted to the right device driver eventually and be sent out the network port. No files involved whatsoever. 
no memory mapped I.O. involved. Good. Okay, so this was the picture I showed you um, before, but I wanted to reiterate it because it probably makes a little more sense now. Basically, here's the listen socket that gets created first. Uh, and every time the client creates a socket and makes a connection request, uh, we basically create a brand new socket that's bound to both socket, to both, um, uh, both sides of this connection. And from that point on, these two clients and server sockets, the green ones, are what the communication is. And if you happen to set up a TCP connection, basically right in one socket, it comes out the other side. Right in this side, it comes out uh, the client side. Okay. And similarly, if you go to do a read call, you basically end up waiting for data to come in from the other side. So pretty simple. Um, and the thing to remember is a connection, namely a, a yellow bar there, is a five tuple of things. And two IP addresses, source and destination, two ports, source and destination, and a protocol, like six, for TCP. Okay, that's what makes this unique. And um, the server side port is often well known. So 80 for regular uh, HTTP or 443 for secure web or 25 for send mail. Okay, good. Any questions on that? Good. So um, if you remember, this is just showing you this in a diagram here. This was server, creates a socket, binds it to an address. Maybe I will talk you through this a little bit more. So that address says, hi, here's my host IP address. Here's the port, like 80 for a web server. And then we basically execute a listen system call on that socket. All right, the client creates a new socket, says, I want to talk to that host and port. So those match. Uh, after the connection happens, uh, the server accepts the connection. And now it can do a read request, which will get matched up with the write request. or we can do a write uh, response, which is matched up with this read request. And those are just both sides of a TCP channel. So you write on one, you read on the other. You write on that one, you read on this one. Okay, And um, you can do that multiple times. Eventually, the close here will cause that sort of four-way thin, uh, four thin uh, that I showed you. And so basically, close will start the fin. This guy will act it. Also, he'll say, well, I'll send the rest of the data. I had to send send my own fin, and then the connection will be closed. And we can go back and get another one. OK? Question, yes? The client knows what port to look for because it's got to be a well-known port. For one, well, let me, let me, I'll say this. There's actually two ways to know. But let's start with well-known ports. So if your laptop is going to talk to a web server, 80, you know, OK? Or you happen to know that that web server is actually on port 8080. That does happen sometimes. And so then you would say, you know, connect to uh, uh, 128.32.65.23 colon 8080. That's actually saying connect to that combination of port and IP address at the remote side. So you have to know it, OK? now. Usually, like I said, you know it because it's well known. Uh, on the other hand, it may not be well known. It may be known just to you. So some of the, uh, let's say, more illicit things that might happen on the internet, you know this through some other channel what the right port is that you're going to bind to. And that's what you make a connection with. But you have to know, the client has to know in advance who they're talking to. Otherwise, they can't connect. Well, random website, so normally those are all well known. So any website that you normally browse is probably either 80 if you say HTTP or 443 if you say HTTPS. That's just, that's the way of the world. So your web browser knows that basically when you're surfing. Okay, that make sense? Now on the client side, um, as I mentioned briefly uh, before when we talked about this, and I'm going to say again, I said there's a five tuple. Uh, two IP addresses, two ports, and a protocol. We know what the protocol is, six, because it's TCP. We know what the IP address and port is at the server side. We know what the IP address of the client is. What the heck is the, cl the client's port? What is the client port? Yeah, it's randomly selected from a certain range. 
It needs to be unique on the client, and um, it needs to be not one of the well-known ports typically, and that's part of the connect process. You basically sort of leave it unbound, and the kernel figures out one for you just to make this a unique connection. And that's why multiple web browsers on the same laptop or multiple windows on the s and multiple tabs in your browser on the laptop all have unique connections because each one gets a random port in this connection process. Yes? So you're, oh, okay, so you're, you're talking about this li listen is bound, and then you're talking about after and accept. No, the power of the five tuple dun, 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 says that there can be many of those yellow connections to the same host and port at the server side without conflict. Because, because every connection is made unique by also the IP address and the port of the client. So there is no conflict. And this listen socket is a very special thing because it's not actually bound to another side. So it's like a, a funny socket that says, I know I'm accepting host colon port things, but I'm not actually bound to anybody else remotely. And so it, there's no conflict there. Good question. There's another one back somewhere. Yes. So that's a really good question. Let me restate this for cyber viewers. So the question is, you got a situation where a bunch of uh, computers are all behind uh, a router and they have the same external IP address. How do you resolve this? And the answer is that that router does something called NAT, NAT, Network Address Translation. And what it does is it takes the request that's coming from the client and recognizes that that request is getting transformed from the IP address of the client to the external IP address. And there's a little table that that router has inside and it makes sure they're all unique. And so it actually generates a brand new random unique port just for the outside world and then translates that port back on the way in to the other guy. It's actually, um, it sounds complicated, but it actually works pretty well. You know, and you can see since the port space is only 16 bits, you can imagine that there's a limit to how much you can do because when the router runs out of ports to use during its NAT uh, process, then you're, you know you can't do any more connection. Good question. Okay. Yes. Well, if. Uh, now we're now we're getting uh, we're getting into uh, complex questions here, but that's a that's a good one. Let me answer this quickly. So the question is, if you have network address translation, how do you set up a server with a well-known port? Out of the box, you don't. But in you but in order to do that, you have to be able to go into your router and configure it and tell it to actually export. Uh, a one-for-one one NAT that says port 80, whenever it comes in to the router, always gets routed to this IP address, port 80, or something. So you can actually set up those mappings. But that's what, that's what a, a high-paid network administrator does. They know how to punch. That's often called punching a hole through the router or firewall, if you ever hear that term. It's basically doing these one-for-one one NAT routes through the NAT firewall to a, a specific server that's in there. That's a good question. Okay, so uh, so here let's look at the client protocol. I just wanted to show you this. So when you create the socket here, notice that I have a couple of parameters that uh, I put together there. One of them is the protocol, and this protocol AFINet says Internet version four. You can use INet six to get Internet uh, to IPv6, and that's kind of saying this socket is on the IPv4 network. 
If you say PF local, this is a, a way to set up a socket that's going to connect uh, only on the local machine. And so it doesn't actually go over the internet, it's going to go uh, to another process on the same machine. The other thing is you sort of say what you want, so SOC stream here is what you say when you want TCP. Okay, because it's a streaming thing. If you want to use UDP, you say SOC DGRAM. And some of these other options uh, are, are harder to use, like SOC RAW, you often have to be a uh, um, system administrator to use, and SOC uh, Seek pack uh, packet only exists on other protocols than INETs and so on. So, okay, but anyway, and once we've made our socket, then we connect that socket by so file descriptor to a given address. And then this is the thing that causes that syn synax sequence to start. Okay? And then if you look at the server side, notice that we bind a listen socket. Oh, surprise, AF INET SOC stream. Same thing here because, by the way, this is the other side of a connection. We do our listen by binding it to the address that we're going to be as our server. And then we go through a loop where we uh, do listen to get the next thing, and then we accept it, and so on and so forth. And if you go back to the very beginning of class, I talked about how the right thing to do here would actually be maybe to fork off a child process to handle that connection, and then go back and do another listen in the parent process. Okay. Good. So, oh, any questions on that before I move on a little bit? Now, I wanted to say a little bit about the internals. So, for instance, if you start looking at uh, Linux network, there's uh, a lot of interesting layers in here. And uh, many things are ha happen at kind of three different layers. There's stuff that happens um, pretty much at user level in uh, glibc and so on. Um, there's the bulk of it is this yellow piece that this is the actual most of the socket implementation, the socket library is just lap wrappers, most of the socket implementation, the actual TCP IP with timeouts, um, and all those layers are in kind of the modules that are in the kernel. And then the network driver, which is the thing that deals with different possible networks, uh, this is often a module in Linux, and so you can basically, with insmod, you can load the module that handles Ethernet, the module that handles Wi-Fi, what have you. And there's a set of well-defined interfaces for those type of network drivers that let this generic yellow box, which does generic TCP IP, talk to any type of network. Okay, so if you were a, if you were a uh, developer of network hardware, you would figure out those red interfaces and that would be what you did. And that would be the driver that you provided with your hardware. Okay, questions? The kernel space is, is uh, pretty much pretty much everything's in the kernel space. Uh, pretty much the socket interface, this is a little bit of stuff up here. The socket interface, the transport layer, TCP, the IP, uh, demultiplexing layers, um, all of that stuff is kind of in the yellow. And then this is the part that's specific to a given network uh, card. Okay. And as you notice, there are sort of interfaces for packets outbound to get sent to the network and packets inbound to get received from the network. And I'm going to say a tiny bit more about these in a second. So um, I, one of the things that you would notice, anybody here ever actually hacked network layers in a kernel? Ah, nobody. Okay. So this would be something that you might do if you took my advanced uh, OS class, if we ever teach it again. Um, but one of the things that is interesting about this is most Unix variants, and actually uh, I'll take that, uh, I'll say even uh, Windows type kernels that deal with networking, have something inside which is the equivalent of this. So in Unix, in Linux, excuse me, these are called SK buffs, socket buffers. And what they are is there's a header, which is the uh, current socket head. And then in that is this linked list of these socket buffers. And these socket buffers hold little chunks of things coming in off the network. And they're linked together. So anytime data comes in off the network, it's put into socket buffers one way or another. Anytime data goes out, it's first put into socket buffers and then handed to the driver as socket buffers. Okay? And if you look a little bit, 
What's interesting is the socket buffer structure has kind of uh, pointers to, uh, to data and end for a big continuous chunk of, of data. And then the head and the tail is the active part of the, uh, of the um, packet. And what's kind of neat about this particular arrangement is as the different layers, suppose this came in off the network, as the different layers um, process this packet, the, uh, the lowest layer looks at the Ethernet header, and then it just increments the head a little bit, and now the thing is, the head is pointing at the IP layer, and you pass it to the IP layer. The IP layer processes it, that increments a little bit, and so on, and so you never copy any data. It's all zero copy. What's happening is these pointers are moving as the, the packet's working its way through the network. And um, the other thing that's quite, uh, most of the time you try to allocate uh, a large chunk here, and in fact this continuous region is often at the end of an SK buffer, which is allocated as a group. But occasionally you want to have a bunch of fragments as well, and so really big packets can be put into pages. And so this is a pretty universal structure. Um, I don't want to go too much more into this. But um, the nice thing about this is you can, for instance, say, here's a packet. I want to clone it to hand it to another uh, routine. And so it's really easy. You can either copy the data or not. You can just clone the header and pass that around and so on. So when you start messing with the network, you'll see that there's a huge number of optimizations whose sole job is to try to avoid copying bytes because that re represents time and overhead. Okay. Um, the last thing I wanted to mo mention a little bit is it's kind of interesting to pass, to watch the, the various uh, um, flow of data that's actually in the network. So for instance, here's an application that's sending some data out of a socket. So what's green here is actually the process, uh, user level process context. So they make system calls to do this stuff. But here's an example of a simple system call that might be just setting up a socket. Um, it goes into the TCP layer at some point um, and doesn't have to go any further and so can return right away. On the other hand, there might be something where you write data into the socket and it goes all the way down to the driver so that's a case where you make the system call and that particular context carries its way all the way through the layers until it actually goes to the NIC driver and comes back out. The key thing, of course, is uh, if you ever have to go to sleep uh, or you ever have to do anything that's deferred, this path is basically um, possible to put you to sleep and wake you up uh, to wait for something. A bunch of other paths here, for instance, are if we ever have timers that go off, like for instance, um, timers that uh, cause a retransmission to occur, those timers uh, are recast as what are called soft interrupts, which I think we talked a little bit about early in the term, which uh, are actually uh, schedulable interrupt structures uh, that can go and, and retransmit. And then finally, the one thing I wanted to mention is when packets come in, what happens is there's a hardware interrupt, which then raises a software interrupt, which is like a kernel process running inside the kernel that then pulls so the interrupt is the first packet. The rest of it is pull, 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 pull until there are no packets left. Uh, and then you sort of return to interrupts again. That's called the NAPI interface, OK? That's the new API for polling to networks. And this is sort of crucial to get 10 gigabits out of the network now. Okay. I don't know if everybody remember I talked briefly about interrupts versus polling kind of earlier in the term. This is, this is it in a net nutshell. It's the NAPI interface takes an interrupt in and then at a soft interrupt context, which is not a hard interrupt context, you're basically busy polling until things run out. And that poll can either pass packets up to users, cause retransmissions to go down, all sorts of stuff. And then eventually you run out of packets coming in, and then you return to the interrupt context. Uh, and then um, the application can restart at that point. So, um, and so this is kind of showing another sign. You're running the user program, an interrupt comes in. you. Uh, do some stuff with freeing sent packets that have been acknowledged, and then you get a soft interrupt. And from that point on, you're pull, 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 and then you come back to the user program. OK. All right. Questions? I just wanted to give you a little flavor for some of what's going on. There's a, there's a, a huge amount of stuff that you can find out. There's a whole, actually, one of the O'Reilly books on the Linux network, which I, I recommend. It's a pretty good book. Um, that sort of tells you the infrastructure if you're ever interested. So I think at this point, yes, let's take a brief break, come back.
we're going to switch topics a little bit. So let's switch gears a little bit and uh, let's get back to what we can do with some of these things now that we've been talking about TCP for instance. So how do you actually program a distributed application and uh, this is kind of a large question. So uh, let's see if we can bite off a little bit of it. So one of the things is there's no shared memory in a distributed application because everything's about messages going back and forth through channels. So um, one abstraction is sending and receiving a messages, which is pretty useful. So you send a message, it goes through the network, it's received from the other side. And uh, there you go. Did everybody catch that? Should we try it again? Woo, okay. So one abstraction here of sending and receiving is interesting because it's atomic, right? When a message goes from source to destination and you've received it, you know that you've received the message because the message has a length in it. And uh, either you received the message or you didn't. You can kind of make that uh, clarification. And as a result, you can build protocols where the atomicity is the message reception. So remember, in shared memory, the problem was when you wrote a bunch of different pieces of shared memory, the way you made it atomic was you had to wrap locks around it. Whereas with message passing, you know it, it was received. <laughs> okay, And um, so that's kind of interesting. So the interface here is kind of uh, this notion that you set up a mailbox, which is a temporary holding area for messages, and then you have send and receive. Now, of course, uh, what is a mailbox if you're using TCP IP? Well, it's you know a, an IP address and a port that you set up. Um, and so basically, send then becomes sending a message, which at the beginning of it says how long it is, and then the rest of the message and receive is pull a whole message out of the buffer. And of course, you're not going to pull a message till you've got all the bytes. And so that's kind of receive ends up being a blocking or non-blocking, if you want to implement it that way, at atomic receive. Okay, and so this is going to be something that you can imagine we can easily build off of TCP IP if we wanted to, but it's an, it's a, uh, an interface that maybe we can build applications out of. All right, and so for instance, you know, when Here's an interesting question. When does send return on the source side? Okay, does it uh, return when the receiver gets the message? Or does it return when the message is just buffered and on the way? Okay, or does it return just immediately? I mean, these are questions you could ask. Because you could ask the question of how much information does the sender get back? 
All right, and that's uh, probably this last one is the one you're really going to get, which is the message is buffered on the source node and going out is probably what send would normally give you. But you could, you could build a version of send that waited until the receiver uh, process got the result if you wanted. Okay, that's a pretty strong semantics and probably not necessary in most cases. So two questions are is sort of when can the sender be sure the receiver actually received the message and when can the sender reuse memory containing the message? I think if we rely on the windowing protocol of TCP IP, the system will know when it's at least acknowledged as having been received on the remote, remote side, okay? All right. So a mailbox provides one-way communication from T1 to T2 with a buffer in the middle. And it's a very similar to a producer-consumer scenario. And I'm not going to say too much more about it other than I give you a really careful uh, or very quick mind version of this. So the producer can do this while, prepare message, send message, and just keep sending messages. And the receiver can do this, receiving messages. And uh, the notion here is that the, uh, neither the sender nor the receiver needs to keep track of buffer space because that's what the windowing system does, you know, the window portion of TCP does for you. Okay, the one thing that sender and receiver might need to do is they may have a maximum buffer size they have to be careful about uh, sending, because if they send a message that's too big, then maybe none of the buffers will hold it. All right. So let's see what's interesting about having a messaging interface. So the first thing, how many people have ever heard of the general's paradox? A couple of you. So. Two generals on separate mountains can only communicate via messengers. See, that's what those folks on horses are. are. Um, these horses, this is, uh, these are horses, okay? Um, and the thing is that messengers can be captured, okay? And so the problem is the two generals have to coordinate attacks so they both arrive at exactly the same time, all right? And if they attack at different times, they die. If they attack at the same time, they win, okay? And uh, basically, it's named after Custer, who basically died because he arrived a little too early. Um, so uh, ignoring the uh, moral implications of that scenario, we'll go on. So can messages over an unreliable network be used to guarantee that two entities do something simultaneously? That's the question. So let's make sure we understand. The two generals are sending messengers to agree on a time and can they know for sure that the time has been agreed upon so that um, they can do something simultaneously? That's the question. And it turns out that um, you can't, even if all the messages get through, because you never know for sure um, whether there's a message that's missing, because it's sort of like, okay, 11 a.m.? Yeah, 11 works. So 11 it is, eh? Yeah, but what if you don't get this act? So the problem is, you can keep going back and forth, and you can never be sure that uh, things have been absolutely agreed on before, uh, before the time shows up. Okay, now you can be pretty sure. You can do this a lot of times. You can be pretty darn sure, but you can never be absolutely sure, and that's the essential paradox here. And so you might say, um, all right, so what can we do? So it turns out that what you can do is something called two-phase commit which is not agreeing on a time, but agreeing that everybody's gonna do something eventually. That's the important difference. And so two-phase commit says, since we can't solve the general's paradox, let's solve a related problem, which is a distributed transaction. Two or more machines agree to do something or not do it atomically. So either they all agree to do it or they all agree not to do it. The one thing we can't be sure about is when they're gonna do it. Okay, so see how I've changed the general's problem there, right? And so two-phase commit, the high-level problem state, statement is kind of as follows. We have a series of uh, participants, and if no node fails and all nodes are ready to commit, they say commit, otherwise they abort on all the nodes. And this is going to happen regardless of the loss of messages, the uh, loss of participants, say they crash and come back. And so, um, this was actually developed by Jim Gray. We mentioned him a couple of lectures ago. Um, and uh, most of you have probably all heard of two-phase commit, right? How many people have heard of two-phase commit? Oh, just a couple of you. Okay. 
So what is the two-phase commit algorithm? So there's one coordinator. So the first thing is we have to figure out how to elect a, somebody in charge. And I'm not going to go into that because that's an interesting problem of itself. And then N workers. And the high-level algorithm is the coordinator asks all the workers if they can commit. If all the workers uh, reply with a vote commit, then the coordinator broadcasts a global commit and everybody commits. Otherwise, the co coordinator broadcasts a global abort and everybody aborts. Now notice that the first thing the coord this is why it's two phases, the first thing the coordinator is doing is saying, are you guys okay with committing? And it's possible that any one of them could say, no, I can't commit because of whatever reason, in which case nobody's going to commit. Okay? And it's only if they all say yes, then we will commit. Okay, now this seems like a very simple protocol. The devil is in the details in the sense of how do we make sure that it doesn't matter how the various participants fail and how the various messages are lost or not lost. We want to make sure that either everybody does it or nobody does it. Okay, everybody clear on the problem statement? So now we're going to use a persistent stable log on every machine to basically keep track of what we're doing and that's going to let us have this nice property that doesn't matter who crashes when, when a machine crashes, it wakes up and checks its log to decide what to do next. And that's going to let us have this atomicity property. What I'm not going to address is what if the log is bad or the disk is dead? Okay, that's not going to be part of our algorithm. So the disk is not going to fail. Okay? These are really good disks with RAID 1000 or something. Okay. So here's what the, uh, I was kidding on that because RAID 1000 could mean nothing, right? Um, so the coordinator basically sends a vote request to all workers. The worker says, uh, well, I'm going to wait, and eventually if I get a vote request, if I'm ready, I say yes. If I'm not, I say abort, and I immediately abort. And then the coordinator says, if I get vote commit from everybody, then I'm going to send a global commit. And if it doesn't get vote commit from everybody, then it sends a global abort. And uh, basically, that message is the confirmation that says, basically, well, um, every, you know, if I, everybody, if anybody gets a global commit, they know the commit's happening. If anybody gets a global abort, they know that abort is happening. Okay. Now you can see many places where this could fail, right? What happens if, you know, uh, one of the vote requests doesn't make it to a worker? Well, maybe that worker can time out and just send an abort back. Or what if? Uh, the coordinator crashes after uh, they sent the request, but before it receives any responses. Okay, what do we do then? What would be a good solution? Well, we'll change the coordinator afterwards, but suppose that the coordinator does crashes and come back up. What can the coordinator do? They can send abort. Right? So remember, all we're trying to do is come up with this atomicity property. Either they all commit or they all abort. Okay? There's no guarantee for necessarily forward progress on this. So here's an example of the failure-free message pattern. Coordinator sends vote requests. They all say vote requ uh, commit. Then we get a global commit that comes back. Okay, anybody questioning the basic protocol? Does this make sense to everybody? Question, yeah. So if you lose a global commit, the nice thing is, and I'm going to show you this in a moment, because there's a log, that worker that didn't get a response can always say to the coordinator, hey, what happened? And the coordinator can say, oh, yeah, global commit, because he can look in his log. So the way this has been set up is that failure at no point in this algorithm will cause a violation of either everybody eventually commits or everybody eventually aborts. But as you've pointed out here, if a worker crashes for 12 days and comes back up, it may be that the commit that's supposed to happen won't happen for 12 days, but it will eventually happen. Okay, so the key is that eventually either everybody commits or everybody aborts. Okay? Good. So, so what you can do is you can actually view this in a state machine, replicated state machine fashion. So for instance, you can say that the coordinator implements simple state machine where uh, they're in an init state, uh, they send a vote request, they receive, they wait for responses, and either they get all uh, vote commits, in which case they send global commits and go to the commit state, 
Otherwise, they send a uh, global abort and go to the abort state. And so at any point along the way, uh, as long as we remember what state we're in by writing it to the log, we're going to be able to come back up and consistently do something so that we don't violate our atomicity. Okay? Similarly, a machine worker, when they receive a vote request, they go from init to either ready or abort, depending on their own preferences. And then uh, if they're in ready, they're gonna, um, they basically said they vote for commit, but they're going to wait to hear uh, whether to abort or not. Okay? And so the trick in all of this is going to be we're going to want to keep track of what state we're in in our log. Okay? And um, so, for instance, dealing with worker failure, uh, so the failure only affects the states in which the coordinator's waiting. And so in wait, if it doesn't get a response from N folks, then it just sends abort. Okay, and, and goes into the abort state. So that's an easy way to work. Um, so here's an example of a worker failing. So we've gone part of the way through the process. This question was just asked. The worker, either the message is lost or the worker is lost. What do you do? At that point, we hit a timeout and then everybody aborts. And if this worker comes back and says, wait a minute, I'm, I thought I sent a vote commit. I thought I was in the middle of this, but I never got a a response back, then it can ask the coordinator, and the coordinator has recorded in its log the fact that it was in the abort state, and that worker can work it out. Okay? And similarly, you can sort of deal with coordinator failure and so on. I don't want to go through all these, but the basic idea here is we're using the log to help get our atomicity properties. So here, actually, I'll show you the coordinator fails. It sends out requests. Eventually, everybody times out, and they just ab vote for an abort. <laughs> And here's another case, the coordinator fails after getting commits and uh, gets restarted and at that point it says, oh, I don't know what was supposed to happen, I'll abort everybody. So you can work your way through this, but um, can anybody tell me the essential, so this seems cool, but what's the essential issue with this protocol? Yes. So, okay, so first question is, are we okay with the potential live lock of aborting frequently? Depends. Good question. What's a related problem with this? So you're kind of, you're kind of on what I was looking at here. There's several, go ahead, yeah. Coordinator is a bottleneck and worse. What else? They're not just a bottleneck. If they go down, yes. They can't receive information. What else? Every worker waits for the coordinator to come back in most instances of this. Or they can turn it into an abort, in which case we've got a live lock. So either we have a deadlock or a live lock with this protocol, but it's really not resilient to a participant going down. Okay, that's an essential issue with two-phase commit. Okay? So everybody catch how I said it turns a potential not you know wait for the coordinator to come back up into a uh, in a board. Nonetheless, the protocol doesn't make forward progress. And so I've told you about durability through the log as you basically just keep track of what state you're in and you can work that out. So um, so distributed you know why is distributed decision making in general useful? And the answer is fault tolerance. So one of the reasons we would want to do this is because this commit abort is really keeping constant state on all of the nodes that might be a database or something, and we're really talking about committing and aborting to that state. And the good thing about that is that may, this makes sure that every participant has exactly the same state, assuming that the protocol is working, and then at that point, if somebody dies, I know I have a properly replicated database. So this is all really, why do we do this? We do this for fault tolerance of a, a higher level protocol that we're using two-phase commit for. And basically a group of machines is coming to a decision, um, even if one of them failed during the process, but they have to come back, right? We can't have a permanent failure or we don't make progress in this protocol. Okay, and after the decision made, the, res the result is recorded in lots of places. So that's why two-phase commit's good. So the undesirable feature of two-phase committing is blocking. And basically, you can just see, we could go through this, but you can just see it. Basically, uh, if the coordinator crashes, 
he has to wait for the coordinator to come back to make any progress. And depending on who you see specified two-phase commit, either a, a worker that waits indefinitely for the coordinator blocks and can't do anything, or they send out aborts, but they still have to wait for the coordinator to come back before they can do anything. So they're really, this protocol is really blocking on the coordinator. Okay. And so that's probably a problem, especially if you're in the internet where things crash all the time, right? So this could be a problem. Now, um, there's lots of alternatives. So there's a three-phase commit, which is much more resilient to nodes being down. Paxos is another one. And actually, I need to put up, I'll put up a paper on Paxos for you guys. It's currently favored by Google and a lot of the big internet companies, which is uh, better than three-phase commit um, and has this property that nodes can really go down and the protocol can still make progress as long as not too many of them go down. So that's a really good variant of distributed decision making. Okay. Now, my favorite, however, though, is this question. What happens if one of them or more of the nodes is actually malicious? So you got a set of nodes, and somebody has broken in to one of the nodes and is managing to manipulate all the message traffic to do something malicious. And keep in track that a malicious node can be one that can fool anybody. You go to try to see whether it's malicious and they respond to you correctly. But in the middle, in the meantime, they're basically doing something pretty hokey with the protocol to cause something bad to happen. That's a malicious participant. All right. And there's something called the Byzantine generals problem, which is the, um, sorry about all this military versions, but this is kind of the way this is, military analogies. But the Byzantine generals problem and then players is there is a general, a Byzantine general, by the way, and some lieutenants, okay, and um, one of them might be malicious, okay, never trust a guy with a blue sword. Um, some number of these can be either insane or malicious, okay, and that number is F, okay, and I'll tell you what F is in a moment. And the idea is the commanding general has to send an order to his N minus one lieutenant such that all loyal lieutenants, those are non-malicious ones, do the same thing. So in this case, the general is saying, telling everybody to attack. The two lieutenants who are not malicious are going to actually attack. The malicious one is going to not only say retreat, but also tell everybody, well, you know, I heard the general tell me retreat. Okay, so lying as well. And the trick is that if uh, all the loyal lieutenants will do the same thing, they either attack or retreat as one, and if the general is loyal or not crazy, they'll do what the general says. So what does crazy mean? Crazy means I'll tell my lieutenants all to do something different. That's an example of a malicious general. Okay, so everybody see this? So this, the Byzantine general's problem says that I can do, I can satisfy IC1 and IC2. All right, and surprisingly, uh, well, first of all, there's some impossibility results which show, for instance, that you can't do this with three. So n equals three where there's a general and two lieutenants, you can't solve it because you can't tell um, whether the general is insane or not from this. So if you look at this case, right, the general is perfectly fine. He tells everybody to attack, but this lieutenant says, well, the general said retreat. This poor guy has no clue what the general said. Similarly, over here, the general is insane and tells one to attack and the other to retreat. This guy can't tell whether the general's insane or actually, you know, or that other lieutenant is malicious, okay? Um, and so it turns out that uh, with F faults, there's a proof that you need at least N greater than 3F to solve this problem. So uh, less than a third of them can be a malicious. And various algorithms exist to solve this. Uh, the original algorithm, which I put up, by the way, for you guys to read, I think it's up for last time, uh, is fun. Okay, you should read this. Um, it's, it's one of those Leslie Lamport papers that's just amusing to read as he s highlights the Byzantine general's problem and goes through a solution. His original thought process shows that there is an existence proof for a, an exponential algorithm that's exponential in N, which of course we all know is bad. And then MIT, back around 2000 or so, came up with a, a nice clean algorithms that are basically have a complexity of order N squared in the number of messages that get sent and can solve this problem. All right, and the use of this Byzantine fault tolerance algorithm, 
basically allows machines to make a coordinated decision as long as less than n over 3 of them are malicious. All right, and the way to think of this is you've got a request comes in, this group of participants all make the decision that they're going to agree on, even if some of them are broken into. Okay, and if you think this through, you can see that you can cast pretty much anything, a database update, a file system change, all of that as a, distrib as a distributed decision like this, in which uh, as long as no more than a third of the uh, participants are malicious, we can make a good decision. Okay, question? All right, now let's see, I think... All right, I think that's good for now. We're not going to talk about distributed file systems. Uh, we'll do that next time. So in conclusion, we've been taught, we talked a lot about TCP over uh, today with uh, reliable byte streams uh, between two processes and the window-based acknowledgement protocol. We talked about two-phase commit, which is a distributed decision-making uh, process. And um, first everybody is asked whether they want to commit, then they're asked to commit. And we talked about the Byzantine generals problem, which is one of my favorite existence proofs of uh, how to build a system when some of the components may be compromised. And uh, next time we'll, we'll pull into um, remote, uh, remote procedure calls and uh, NFS file systems. Needless to say, those will not be on the exam. You guys have a good exam. We'll see you on Wednesday. Uh, may the net force be with you. F equals MA rules the universe, except uh, around black holes and when you're going too fast. All right, see you later. <laughs>